revisit an old topic, maybe, uh, and that is of induction chemotherapy. And, and Josh, I know you guys do uh, a fair bit of it, or at least uh, still uh, continue to study it. And uh, tell us, is there a role for induction chemotherapy in locally advanced head and neck cancer? If so, where it is, and, and where where's the field going? Yeah, so induction chemotherapy is something that people have studied a lot. Um, I think there have been a lot of studies looking at induction chemotherapy. The idea is we can get chemotherapy into a person much faster than the radiation oncologist can set up their simulation. And in addition to that, when we look at concurrent chemoradiation studies um, in head and neck cancer, what they consistently show is an improved local regional control with a lack of improvement in distant metastases. And we tend to think of chemotherapy spreading throughout the body as a way to diminish those. So induction chemotherapy is an appealing option. There have been multiple studies looking at this, and it's difficult to know exactly its place. Um, the way that I tend to use it in my clinic is for a patient who is unable to tolerate concurrent chemoradiotherapy or for whom they um, are unable to get radiation quickly. So one of my colleagues refers to this as the Christmas rule. If it is Christmas Eve and you have a patient and they have a massive tumor, it might be problematic to get them onto radiation quickly. And the issue is, the reason why I would tend to prioritize chemoradiotherapy over induction is we don't have good comparative data to say that induction is better. And we do know that patients who have induction chemotherapy, there are some of those patients, up to 25% in some studies, who are unable then to receive the concurrent chemoradiotherapy, the concurrent chemotherapy, at least, component of that. And that's highly problematic because the concurrent chemoradiotherapy is the definitive part that we think is curing patients. And so I I hesitate to add a treatment that may diminish my ability to administer the curative intent therapy. I, 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 I would just say that, you know, to the extent that there were large randomized trials, whether or not they, they quite had the event rate that Ezra and, and, and the other people who chaired these studies expected, those studies did not show a benefit for induction. And um, I, I would actually take a, a much more conservative view, I think, which is that induction therapy as a way to improve overall survival for unselected patients does not have a role. Um, we continue to use it, as, as you say, for the patient who um, needs something quickly, and, and that's particularly the person who can't lie flat and have the mask made. Yeah. Um, so uh, situations where you can decrease the size of the tumor and get them to chemo radiation um, ex you know, as expeditiously as you can. but um, make it happen in a way that it couldn't without the induction therapy. Um, or someone whose tumor is really so, so large, uh, the, the longest dimension, you know, in the 8, 10 centimeter range, where, where older data show that CRs are extremely uncommon. Uh, we use it there. I think the, the, the other way that I think about uh, induction, though, is the uh, possibility that it has for predicting how a person's going to do with radiation. So the, the old University of Michigan chemo selection approach. And you may see a person who's got an early T4 larynx cancer. Their function was, was pretty good until recently. Um, you see a little bit of cartilage invasion, but the, the larynx isn't gone. And they don't want a total laryngectomy. I think if you give them a cycle of chemotherapy, and you see that there's no response, you can show them the old data from the University of Michigan. Very clearly, they're going to be very, very likely to require a salvage laryngectomy for disease control, not just for, for func functional loss. Um, so, so I think in the chemo selection setting, it's, it can be extremely useful.